Where's all the time going? Today is March 31st. It's the last day of March. Tomorrow is April Fool, Fool's Day. Hope you have a fun day tomorrow. And I'm going to start chapter seven now. And the title of chapter seven is called The Sugar Snow. What do you think that, can you picture that? What do you think that's like? For days, the sun shone and the weather was warm. There was no frost on the windows in the morning. All day, the icicles fell one by one from the eaves with soft smashing and crackling sounds into the snowbanks beneath. The trees shook their wet black branches and chunks of snow fell down. When Mary and Laura pressed their noses against the cold window panes, they could see the drip of water from the eaves and the bare branches of the trees. The snow did not glitter. It looked soft and tired. Under the trees, it was pitted where the chunks of snow had fallen and the banks beneath the path were shrinking and settling. Then one day, Laura saw a patch of bare ground in the yard. All day it grew bigger and before night the whole yard was bare mud. Only the icy path was left and the snow banks along the path and the fence and beside the wood pile. Can't I go out and play, Ma? Laura asked and Ma said, May? Laura, may I go out and play? She asked. You may tomorrow, Mom promised. That night, Laura woke up shivering. The bed covers felt thin and her nose was icy cold. Ma was tucked, had tucked another quilt over her. Snuggle close to Mary, Ma said, and you'll get warmer. In the morning, the house was warm from the stove, but when Laura looked out the window, she saw that the ground was covered with soft, thick snow. All along the branches of the trees, the snow was piled like feathers and it lay in mounds along the top of the rail of the fence and it stood up in great white balls on top of the gate posts. Pa came in shaking the soft snow from his shoulders and stamping it from his boots. It's a sugar snow, he said. Laura put her tongue quickly to a little bit of the white snow that lay in the fold of his sleeve. It was nothing but wet on her tongue like any snow. She was glad that nobody had seen her taste it. Why is it sugar snow, Pa? She asked him, but he, but he said he didn't have time to explain now. He must hurry away. He was going to Grandpa's. Grandpa lived far away in the big woods where the trees were closer together and larger. Laura stood at the window and she watched Pa, big and swift and strong, walking away over the snow. His gun was over his shoulder, his hatchet and powder horn hung at his side, and his tall boots were made, made great tracks in the soft snow. Laura watched him till he was out of sight in the woods. It was late before he came home that night. Ma had already lit the lamp where he came in when he came in. Under one arm, he carried a large package. In the other one was a big covered wooden bucket. Here, Carolyn, he said, handing the package and the bucket to Ma. Then he put the gun on its hooks over the door. If I'd met a bear, he said, I couldn't have shot him without dropping my load. Then he laughed. And if I had dropped that bucket and the bundle, I wouldn't have had to shoot him. I could have stood and watched him eat when what's in what's in them and lick his chops. Ma unwrapped the package and there were two hard brown cakes, each as large as a milk pan. She uncovered the bucket and it was full of dark maple syrup. Here Laura and Mary Pa said and he gave them each a little round package out of his pocket. They took all of the paper wrappings and each one was a hard brown cake with beautifully crinkled edges. Bite it, said Pa, with his blue eyes twinkling. Each bit off one tiny crinkle and it was sweet. It crumbled in their mouths. It was even better than their Christmas candy. Maple sugar, said Pa. Supper was ready and Laura and Mary laid the little maple sugar cakes beside their plates while they ate the maple syrup on their bread. After supper, Pa took them on his knees as he sat before the fire and told them about his day at Grandpa's and the sugar snow. All winter, Pa said, Grandpa has been making wooden buckets and little troughs. He made them out of cedar and white ash for those woods won't give a bad taste to the maple syrup. 
To make the troughs, he split out little sticks as long as my hand and as big as my two fingers near one end. Grandpa cut the stick in half, though, and split one half off. Then he left the other side flat with a square piece at the end. Then, with a bit, he bored a hole lengthwise through the square part. With a, his little knife, he whittled the wood till it only was a thin shell and a round hole. The flat part of the stick he hollowed out with his knife till it was little enough. He made dozens of these. He made 10 new wooden buckets. Then he had them all ready when the first warm weather came and the sap began to move in the trees. Then he made uh, what went into wood, maple woods and with his bit he bored a hole into each maple tree and he hammered the round end in of the little trough into the hole and he set the cedar bucket on the ground under the flat end. The sap you know is the blood of the trees. It comes from the roots when the warm weather begins in spring and it goes to the very tip of each branch and twig to make the green leaves grow. Well, when the maple sap comes to the hole in the tree, it ran out of the tree and down the little trough and into the bucket. Oh, it didn't hurt the poor tree, Laura asked. No, more than it hurts you when I prick your finger and it bleeds, said Pa. So here are some pictures of the bucket that Grandpa made and the little um, troughs that he made that went into the tree to catch the syrup. And here are pictures of them in the trees with the maple syrup dripping out and then they're carrying the buckets back. Um, if you remember, we read a story about maple trees and maple syrup. Every day Grandpa puts his boots and his warm coat and his fur cap and he goes out into the snowy wood and he gathers the sap with a barrel on a sled. He drives from tree to tree and he empties the sap from the barrel, the buckets into the barrel. Then he hauls it to a big iron kettle and he hangs it from, by a chain <clears throat> from a cross timber between two trees. He empties the sap into an iron kettle and there in a big bonfire under the kettle, the sap, sap boils and grandpa watches it carefully. The fire must be hot enough to keep the sap boiling, but not so hot that it will, bo it will boil over. Every few minutes, the sap must be skimmed. Pa grandpa skimmed it with a big long handle and a wooden ladle that he made from brass, brass wood. Okay, so here's a picture of when he goes to collect the syrup from the trees. And then here's a picture of him boiling it and skimming it over the fire. Grandpa lifts ladlefuls of it high in the air and he pours it back slowly. This cools the sap a little and keeps it from boiling too fast. When the sap has boiled down just enough, he fills the buckets with syrup. After that, he boils the sap until it grains. When he cools it in a saucer. The instant the sap is graining, Grandpa jumps to the fire and rakes it all out from beneath the kettle. Then as fast as he can, he ladles the thick syrup into milk pans that are standing ready. In the pans, the syrup turns to cakes of hard brown maple sugar. So that's why it's called sugar snow because Grandpa is making sugar, Laura asked. Hmm. You think that's why they call it sugar snow? Here he's pouring it into the milk cans where it's going to harden and it turn into the sugar cakes. No, Pa said it's called sugar snow because the snow at this time of year means that men can make more sugar. You see, this little cold spell and the snow will hold back the leafing of the trees that makes the longer run of sap. Oh, I see. When there's a long run of sap, it means that Grandpa can make enough maple sugar to last all year for a common every day. When he takes his furs to town, he will not need to trade for much 
store sugar. He will get only a little store sugar to have on the table when company come. Pa must be glad there is sugar. Grandpa must be glad there's sugar snow, Laura said. Yes, Pa said he's very glad. He's going to, to sugar off again next Monday, and he says we must all come. Ooh. Pa's blue eyes twinkled, and he had been saving the best for last. He said to Ma, hey, Carolyn, there will be a dance. Ma smiled. She looked very happy, and she laid down her mending for a minute. Oh, Charles, she said. Then she went on with her mending, but she kept on smiling. She she said, I'll wear my Delaine. Her Delaine dress was beautiful. It was dark green, had little patterns all over it, and that looked like ripe strawberries. The dressmaker, a dressmaker had made it in the east, in a place where Ma came from when she married Pa and moved out west to the big woods in Wisconsin. Ma had been very fashionable before she married Pa, and the dressmaker had made her clothes. The Delane was kept wrapped in paper and laid away. Laura and Mary had never seen Ma wear it, but she had shown it to them once. She had let them touch the beautiful dark red buttons and buttoned the basque up the front, and she had shown them how neatly the whale bones were put in the seams inside with hundreds of little cross stitches. It showed how important the dress was if Ma was going to wear it a beautiful, or how important the dance was if Ma was going to wear her beautiful Delaine dress. Laura and Mary were excited. They bounced up and down on dad's knees and asked questions about the dance until at last he said, now you girls run along to bed. You, you'll know all about the dance when you see it. I have to put my a new string on my fiddle. And so here's a picture, I believe, of Black Susan the cat and his fiddle and the lamp that they use to see at night. Hmm. There were sticky fingers and sweet, sweet mouths to be washed. Then they said their prayers and, and there were prayers to be said. By the time Laura and Mary were snug in their trundle bed, Pa and the fiddle were both singing while he kept time with his foot on the floor. I'm Captain Jinx of the Horse Marines. I feed my horse on corn and beans. And I often go beyond my means, for I'm Captain Jinx of the Horse Marines. I'm a captain in the Army. Chapter 8, tomorrow is going to be called Dance at Grandpa's. So I hope you'll join me tomorrow to hear that story as well. Remember, make it a good day or not, the choice is yours. But I hope it was a good day and that you have, you're getting some of your schoolwork done and you're getting outside to get some fresh air too.